It's a windstream outage, so don't blame us or the Holy Spirit. It's the windstream. <laughs> but uh, but so I'm I'm really glad that we do have ways that people can connect online, and uh, and at a time like this, uh, it just means that they'll be able to do that a little bit later. But uh, but it's good that uh, that we have that capability. Um, so that meeting today and next week is very important to, to help you get information. Uh, and you can also watch that uh, on, online later in the week if you need to. Also, uh, tomorrow we have an administrative council meeting at 6.30 here at the church. And then Tuesday is a worship committee meeting at 6.30. And Wednesday is choir at 6.30. And what would the week be if we didn't plan something as well on Thursday? So Thursday is a trustees meeting at 6.30. And believe it or not, there are some people that will be at all of those meetings every, every night of the week. So uh, we, uh, we wanted to make sure that you're aware of those things going on on the calendar. And as we prepare for worship and as the acolytes bring the light of Christ forward, uh, let us uh, center on God's presence here. Good morning, Hopewell. Good morning. It's time to wake up and enjoy yourself. We're in the house of the Lord. Where we all know God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. All right. Please go to your uh, bulletin and go to the call of worship, Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise the Lord, you angels. Praise the Lord, you angels. Sing praises, your heavenly host. Praise the Lord, O Son of the moon. Join in song, O shining stars. Praise the Lord, snow and rain. Blow loud, wind and storm. Praise the Lord, O trees. Dance with joy, O birds. Praise the Lord, women and men. Rejoice, children and rulers. Praise the Lord, mothers and aunts. Give praise, grandfathers and cousins. Let all creation praise God's name. Praise the Lord. Let us pray together. Alpha and Omega, you make your home with us. You dry our tears and quench our thirst. You are the tender love. Welcome among all people. Like a mother, you are children. children. Give, Give them, them life, life and teach, teach them, them to love. To love. Come and dwell with us. us and make, make all things new. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is number 62, All Creatures of Our God and King. We're going to sing the first, third, fifth, and seventh verses. Oh. 
All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise ye, alleluia. Oh, brother, son with golden beam. Oh, sister, moon with silver gleam. Oh, praise ye, alleluia. Sister, water flowing clear, make music for thy Lord to hear. Alleluia, alleluia. Oh, brother, fire who lights the night, providing an enhancing sight. Oh, praise ye, oh, praise ye. Alleluia, alleluia. Giving others take your part. Oh, praise ye, alleluia. Ye who long pain and sorrow bear, praise God and on him cast your care. Oh, praise ye, oh, praise ye, alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Creator bless and worship him in humbleness. Oh, praise ye, alleluia. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit three in one. Oh, praise ye, oh, praise ye, alleluia, alleluia. Hallelujah. Please remain standing and join with me in our affirmation of faith, which is uh, number 884, a statement of faith of the Korean Methodist Church. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the Savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God contained in the Old and New Testaments as the sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the Church, those who are united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God, where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Today, for our prayers of people, if after I say the names, if you will say, Lord, hear our prayers. To the family of Hope Cheshire, Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. To the family of Sheldon Boudris, Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. To Clara Hendricks, Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Darlene Hill, Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Jack Carruthers, Lord, hear our prayers. Diane Prosser, Lord, hear our prayers. Unspoken requests, Lord, hear our prayers. 
Betty Martin. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Sheila Reynolds. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. On this next one, I'd like you to say, Lord, thank you for prayers. We want to say praises that Mitch Luke, for his safety back in the United States, any more information, you can go to Pete after the church, but we want to say praise the Lord. Praise, praise the, the Lord. Lord. And we do have a quilt to dedicate today to the Lord. If Gail and Brad Oliver will come up, they will tell you more information about this quilt. Here, I can hold it. Go ahead. <coughs> the prayer quilt today is being dedicated to my lifelong friend, Jack Carruthers. Jack and I attended and graduated from a military high school in Tennessee, Castle Heights Military Academy in 1955. He now lives in Tupelo, Mississippi in a nursing facility. Jack is a very strong Christian and he loves America and he loves the military. Jack spent his entire career in Rhode Island as a church organist. Jack has recently been diagnosed with blood cancer and serious heart disease. His health has been failing rapidly since our last reunion in October at Castle High School. We get there every year, 2021. He can no longer live independently, so he's in a nursing facility and he has no family. Many of Jack's belongings were destroyed accidentally when his health forced him to move. I know Jack will love this beautiful prayer quilt and the cross and the patriotic colors. But your prayers and love will mean even more to my dear friend than you can imagine. Thank you. Oh, you want to touch it? Paul, you like Go ahead. Go ahead. I invite you uh, to pray, to join me in prayer. Uh, were you going to say something as well? Or? Okay. Uh, to join me in prayer this morning uh, over this quilt uh, so, that, so that Jack knows as he receives it that the congregation has prayed, continues praying, and then uh, when we take it out uh, at the end of the service, you can stop at the quilt, tie a little knot, and as you tie the knot, in the quilt, uh, say another little prayer, and those knots then remind him that those prayers continue to, uh, to be held by, by this quilt. Would you pray with me? God, we are grateful for Jack, for his friendship, for his faithfulness, for his life, and for the ways that you are involved in his life still to this day. We're grateful for the prayers that uh, accompany this quilt, the way it was made, the, the, the prayers that continue to go with it as it is taken to Jack. And we ask that it be a comfort for him over the time ahead, especially as he faces this illness. Help him to be reminded of your presence with him. Continue to bring healing and, and health and peace into his life. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So today especially, uh, I know some of you walked up and you're like, man, we got a lot of quilts we're going to be praying over today. But actually what we're doing is uh, this is our, the, the fifth anniversary of this ministry, of the prayer quilt ministry. And we wanted to recognize that this morning uh, and thank God for that ministry. And uh, uh, Flo is going to tell us a little bit about, about that uh, and how that started. And, and then we'll have a, a, a litany that we'll read together. Prayers and Squares started with a, a group, a quilting group, in at Hope United Methodist Church in San Diego in 1992. And um, that, it was a group that just got together to make quilts for no s express purpose except to do that. And the grandmother of this little boy, two-year-old little two, two year old, um, Cody, um, who was in the hospital in a coma, and they were very pessimistic about the outcome, um, said, might we do a quilt for Cody that could be on his bed? And there's a picture of him online um, in the coma with that quilt there. But because of the importance of that quilt, they said that when he started to wake up, but was not fully awake, was just beginning to come around, that he fingered that quilt the whole time. Hmm. And so the doctors wrote in his orders that it was never to be away from him, that it was always be, would always be close to him. And so the um, Prison Squares ministry was a result of that 
first little quilt for Cody, who did survive and thrive. Um, and then we heard about it. There was a group, um, President Square's group in Aldersgate United Methodist Church in Augusta. A friend of mine was a part of that and said, you know, this might be something that you would be interested in. And so she showed me a quilt that had been done for her mother. And I thought, you know, that just looks like a Hopewell thing. <laughs> but I don't know. And so when we announced it at church, we had um, 15 people who were interested and nine of those people are still very active. We've had some who have moved and then others who are active on a less frequent basis. But it obviously took hold. And Jan will tell you in a little bit about um, how many we've made and that kind of thing. Um, so on May 21st, 2017, that's not right, on May 17th, 2017, um, we, we were chartered. Uh, and our charter number is 1,241, so that there were that many already in place when we joined the group. Um, Prayers and Squares is an interfaith organization that combines prayer with the gift of a hand-tied quilt. And our motto is, it's not about the squares, it's about the prayers. Mm -hmm. um, there are three guiding principles that we have to subscribe to. Uh, or ascribe to, and they are to strive to involve as many people as possible in prayer using quilts as the way to do so. Um, we have to ask someone if they want to receive a quilt, and then we ask how we can pray for them and um, what amount of information can be made public regarding their situation. And then the third thing is that we're not allowed to accept any money for a quilt, though many of you have been very generous um, and supported us through these years. And we meet um, most third Sundays at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. We don't take ourselves real seriously, <laughs> but we take our work very seriously. And I have two prayers here that kind of reflect what we do. One says, bless our hands that they be steady, bless our fingers that they be nimble, bless our seams that they be straight, bless our hearts that they be patient, bless the friendships we build as we do your work, bless all those for whom we work this day and all days, amen. And to show you that we're not necessarily all that serious sometimes, this is a prayer that I think I might have heard some of the stringers, they call themselves stringers. You know, those um, ties are one of, the one of the most important elements. And so this is a prayer that you might hear them say. It says, Dear God, either enlarge that hole in the needle or shrink this thread. <laughs> Um, now, what Flo said about it's not about the squares, it is about the prayers. When I first started five years ago, I kept saying that was my mantra because um, I started sewing and I wasn't sure if my quilts or squares were actually going to stay together. So I just kind of kept praying it's about the prayers, it's about the prayers. And I hope when it goes on to the next step that if they're, they're messed up, that they'll fix them because I just prayed that they would, my squares would hold together. But I am here to tell you about the numbers um, today. Today's quilt was number 169 that was blessed and prayed over right here at this church. So we've done 169 people we have blessed or rededicated, and so we are very happy about that. So we currently have 28 quilts ready to give out, five children, five youth, 15 women, and three men. Now, some of you might say, wow, 28, that's a lot. But um, it takes time to make a quilt, and you never know who needs one. And plus, it's always nice to have a selection to choose from. Uh, but lately, we've actually needed more men's quilts, so we're trying to busy, we're busily trying to get that done right now. Our stringers today will be adding ties to three more quilts today. Our sandwichers have 10 that need sandwiching, five men, three youth, and two women. Our sewers, we need some of those, please. 
<laughs> we have 13 bags designed and ready to be sewn together. As soon as we get our monogram center completed, um, most of these uh, does, uh, these bags have men, were, they were designed with men in mind. Our cutters have 21 bags that need attention. I pr our priority will be the men material bags. Um, at first. Uh, plus we have about six baskets of donated material that we have to make even more quilts from. We love what we do and we do what we love. Uh, we just thank you for everything you do to help us with this ministry. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a few questions to ask. Um, if, if, you, uh, if you would stand if, prayer, uh, if you are a Prayers and Squares regular. Uh, stand, uh, remain standing. Uh, stand if you buy fabric, or uh, or or donate fabric for for prayers and squares, or have ever in the past. If you uh, cut squares, any who cut squares, uh, design the quilts, uh, stitch the squares, sandwich the layers. Okay, these are the people who are involved in prison. This is what they do: turn uh, turn and press. And add the ties, the, the, the uh, strangers. <laughs> also, if you have been a sponsor of a quilt at any time, of those 157? 169. 169. If you have been a sponsor of a quilt or requested a quilt, go ahead and stand. If you have received a quilt, go ahead and stand. And I know that online we have many who are standing or raising their hand and recognizing that they have also received. And finally, if you have prayed over a quilt, which is the most important part of these quilts, uh, please stand. We just had a prayer over one quilt. Yes, yes. Um, and, and even tied knots, as you'll get an opportunity to do that in back. So I invite you now to join us as you're standing in this prayer, this Thanksgiving in prayer for the Prayers and Squares ministry. It's printed in your worship folder. And if you would follow along as I read. Holy and gracious God, we come to you this day in thanksgiving and praise, thanking you for this wonderful ministry you have given us. We thank you for the time, talent, and resources you provide to make it all possible. We especially thank you for the prayers of those who surround this ministry, keeping all in the palm of your hands. We praise you for the opportunities to pray for ourselves for our loved ones, and for those whom we will never meet, but through our prayer quilts. We lift up the quilts being made. May your Holy Spirit rest on them so they may be instruments of your love, grace, peace, and healing, so you and you alone may give to the recipients of the quilts. Bless also all who come into contact with the quilts. Take this ministry and continue to lead it where you would have it go. Open our eyes to see you. Open our ears to hear you. Open our hearts to love you. And open our hands to continue to serve you. All of this we ask through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And we'll continue in the spirit of prayer beginning with our own silent prayers, your own silent prayers as you listen for God's presence, as you concentrate on the things that God may be asking you to focus, and then we'll move on into the uh, pastoral prayer this morning. Let us pray. Oh God, what a splendid place your world is in the spring. The dandelions decorate the hills. The roses spread their passionate colors all over in big and little bushes. And small things like lilies and zinnias begin to show their buds. All around us, oh God, is evidence of the beauty, the specialness the importance of the right connections between vine and branch. 
We rejoice in the marvels of your world and in the way creation graces our lives with such beauty. But yet, O oh God, we are so quick to see the sensible in such connections, but also ignore those connections that mean so much in our lives. We cut ourselves off from you and we lose sense of wonder and mystery. We cut ourselves off from loved ones and family time and we can't figure out why we seem to be disoriented and dissatisfied. We cut ourselves off from times of unhurried contemplation and don't understand why we can't get as many good ideas as we used to. We cut ourselves off from fellowship, from being with the community, and we can't figure out why we don't seem as vital as we once were. We cut ourselves off from doing things for others and can't figure out why we don't feel as good about who we are as we used to. God, forgive us for our neglect and encourage us to choose more carefully the connections that you set up and create for our lives, those connections that are so helpful. How good it is to celebrate our connections between one another. How good it is to renew old connections and make new ones. For all who travel safely and share the joys of hugging old friends and remembering good times, we thank you, O oh God. For all who find new friends in unexpected places, we thank you. God, there are among us those who carry unspoken burdens, those who face uncertain futures, those who shake hands every day with pain, those who get up in the morning hoping against hope things would somehow miraculously change for them. Be their vine and their strength and support, O oh God. And there are among us those who bear the scars of broken relationships, those who wonder if they will ever trust love again. We ask that you would be the vine of love that renews their trust, O oh God. And there are those who would like the freedom to be in a meaningful relationship. Be the vine of new opportunity. Through the one true vine, Jesus Christ, we pray. And continue praying the prayer that he taught us together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.
we'd like to invite uh, the children to the front for the children's message this morning as we all learn from this message. Good morning. Good morning. I have a pretty, um, I think you've been asked this question before, especially being in school. Um, but what is the weirdest thing that you've seen someone eat? <laughs> what is the weirdest thing that you have seen someone eat? Cassidy? A boy dip. Apples and ketchup. Apples dipped in ketchup. Oh, goodness. So, it, what's the weirdest thing that you seem to want to eat, Solomon? How old are you now? Oh, that many? So you've probably seen some people eat some pretty weird things. I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> OK. Anyone else want to share? Have you seen someone eat something pretty weird? No. I saw someone eat a live goldfish once. A live goldfish? Mm -hmm. I ate an earthworm once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My cat ate a live fly and he jumped around. Oh my time. goodness. Did you, what did you want to say? I got, I got, um, I don't know which one to pick. I see many people eat weird things. Name one. Well, just name one. Uh, forget, it. <laughs> forget it. Forget <laughs> it. They're all weird. Okay. Yeah, Angela oh. has one. Oh, someone. Oh, okay. Is meatloaf a dog? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Miss Angela, they don't know about that yet. <laughs> what did you want to say? Someone ate a fish. Someone ate a fish. Oh, was it, was it still alive? Oh, goodness. Well, I, I, I wanted to say that today um, because food was one of those things that separated the Jewish people from the Gentiles. Um, and Aaliyah and Solomon, um, Jewish people, um, Gen Gentiles were like us. You know, we weren't Hebrews, we weren't Jews, okay? And so um, the Jews, they had laws about everything. They had laws about what you could wear, when you could wear it, what you could eat, when you could eat it, um, who you could talk to, who you couldn't talk to, who you get in trouble for talking to, um, where you could pray, who you could pray to, what you could pray about, when you could pray about those things. They had laws about everything. But Peter, loud mouth Peter, <laughs> I love Peter. Um, so Peter had, it's not really a dream, and it wasn't really a dream because when you're dreaming, are you awake or are you asleep? Unless you're daydreaming. Unless you're daydreaming, yeah. Yeah, unless you're daydreaming. But if you're dream dreaming, you're asleep, right? But Peter wasn't asleep. I always thought, when I was you guys' age, I always thought it was a dream that he had when he was asleep. But he was praying and he was awake and he had this vision. It was like a a waking daydream type thing, Connor, yeah. Yeah, and in that dream, that waking vision while he was praying, God told him that you can eat whatever you want to and it's not gonna keep you from going to heaven, okay? Um, so that means if you wanted to eat a sandwich with monkey fingers on it <laughs> would that keep you from going to heaven sandwich. what now Why do you um because it's things in between each other so it's a sandwich. no <laughs> but yeah those th if you wear the wrong thing will that keep you from going to heaven no if you eat the right things will it make you go to heaven no 
If you wear nice white clothes every single day, and if you pray at 12 o'clock every day, no matter what, will that let you go to heaven? Will that let you go to heaven? No. Who's that one person, believing in that one person, who's that one person that'll let you go to heaven? Say, ah, you said it. That's right, Layla. You're so smart. Believing in Jesus, that's the one way to get to heaven. I wanted to show you something, okay? I wanted to show you the sign language for Jesus. All right, take your little hand. Ah, so that's how you would spell his name. But in sign language, um, you can come up with a symbol for your name. So my sign language name was always Rashida, with two hands like that, Rashida. And so my friends who were hard of hearing, they knew that whenever I did that, that I was talking about myself or someone was talking about me. So you're right, Connor, you could spell it out like that, like J-E-S-U-S, -S, or you could do this. You ready? Hands like this, okay? All right. Bam, and bam, Jesus. Okay? Jesus. Right? That's the one way that you can get to heaven. Good job. Let's say a quick prayer, my darlings. Oh, you had a question? Yes. Pardon? Where is heaven? It's 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 up it's beyond okay it's beyond it's not in the stratosphere it's not in the mesosphere it's not in the troposphere it's not even in outer space connor it's beyond yeah that's a good question and do you know what connor Let's study some more on that, okay? So you can find out what and when you'll get to see heaven, okay? Yeah, a lot of people do think it's on the clouds and it's a place that you can, like, fly to, but it's not. Look, Connor, have the faith to know that it is beyond here, okay? It's beyond. And no matter what you wear or say or do, it's not going to get you there. You have to do what? Believe in show me with your hands believe in that's right i just yep you got it dude any other questions no all right let's say a quick prayer dear heavenly father thank you for this day and thank you for these children and thank you for these wonderful questions and give us faith to believe and know that no matter what we do no matter what we wear no matter what we eat it's not going to keep us from heaven that believing in Jesus Christ is the only way to, for us to get there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Thank you. I almost called them the dingalings, so. But I didn't, so. <laughs> Our scripture lesson comes to us from Acts, the 11th chapter, beginning with verse 1. Listen now for God's word as it speaks to us this day. Now the apostles and the brothers and sisters who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa, praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four cor corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Would you pray with me? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts here this, this morning be acceptable to you our God and our salvation. Amen. A friend once told me that he had experienced and heard about a couple of different ways that you would break a horse. Some of you may be familiar with these different ways. The first, he said, is uh, you, it, it happens very quickly, usually, and uh, you, the, the, the person who is training the horse gets up on the horse, and holds on tight, and the horse starts bucking or running or kicking or braying, and eventually, with, depending on the, the trainer and the horse and who's stronger, the, the will is broken. Perhaps that's where that term comes from, breaking a horse or breaking it of the, its habits. But eventually, the horse realizes who is in control, and the horse calms down, and the horse is broken. The second way takes a little bit longer. The second way begins with a trainer uh, beginning to, to feed the horse by hand, rubbing the horse's neck a bit, uh, walking up to the horse very calmly. Eventually, they, he, might, he or she, the trainer, might uh, put a blanket on the horse's back and walk the horse around a little bit, uh, put a, a light rope around the horse's neck, and just follow it along, help the horse know that, that he's there, that, that this trainer is watching him and, and helping him. Eventually, the trainer might put a little bit of weight on the horse's back, not totally, not get up on the back, but just kind of lean over onto it, uh, add a little bit of extra weight at times. The horse begins walking around and getting used to this activity, and, and uh, pretty soon the, the tra trainer is able to put a, a small saddle on the horse, just set it up there, maybe connect it a little bit, but it doesn't, doesn't take a lot of weight for this, just this small saddle. 
continue walking the horse around, and eventually the, the trainer puts more weight on the horse and might even be able to hop up on the horse for a short time and sit on that, on that saddle. After a while longer, the trainer finds that he can put the, the bridle and the bit around the horse's face and in the horse's mouth and continue walking the horse and leading the horse that way until one day, and this may be days or weeks or maybe even months later, the trainer is able to get up on the horse and the saddle and the horse recognizes that the trainer is in control and knows, understands this relationship. And the horse is broken. And people might say, well, at what point is the horse broken? Was it when the trainer uh, put the blanket on or when the trainer was able to direct the horse around uh, the, the corral in a circle? Or was it when the trainer actually got up on the horse? Where was the horse broken? And when did the horse learn that he could trust the trainer? Conversion is a lot like that. And some of you know, some of you in your conversion or in the conversion stories you've heard, you recognize conversion stories where a person can point to this is the day and the time and the instance and the experience that converted me or converted my neighbor or converted somebody, even some names in the Bible. Other conversions, though, take a process. My own, I would say, I can't point to one point and say, this is when I was converted because I grew up in a Christian family. I grew up going to church. I grew up asking questions and getting answers and trying to understand. And eventually I recognized that I had put a lot of trust in God and that God was the one who was overseeing my life and was directing me and had, had, uh, had taken that uh, or that I had given it to God. But I can't point to one place that I was converted or broken in such a case. Both of them are conversion stories and anything in between there. And one thing I like about the book of Acts, which was also written by Luke, the one who wrote the Gospel of Luke, is that it has a number of conversion stories in it, and each one involves a different way that the individuals are converted. We're dealing with the Holy Spirit here in Acts. It's called the Acts of the Apostles, but in many ways it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit is doing in the church and in believers and in conversion stories. In the book of Acts, for example, you have the conversion story of the Ethiopian eunuch. He's in, uh, in a, a, a uh, chariot uh, on its way back to his home country, and he's reading uh, from the scroll of Isaiah, and Philip arrives and recognizes what he's reading from, and he asks him some questions. Do you understand what you're reading? And the, the, the Ethiopian says, not really. I'm, I've got a lot of questions. And so they sit down and they start, they start talking about this. And Philip starts telling him about Jesus and the gospel and, the, and all, all that he has experienced and all that he knows. And eventually he can tell, the eunuch even says, uh, what would stop me from being baptized here right now? And Philip says, well, nothing. And the eunuch says, here's, here's some water. Let's do it right now. And he baptizes him, and he is converted in that moment. There's also the conversion story from Acts 2, where 3,000 Jewish believers are baptized and, and, uh, and receive the Holy Spirit that day. It's a huge experience of conversion, a huge witness and testimony of conversion when the Holy Spirit descends on the church and the people in the crowds are saying, what is going on here? And Peter preaches to them, and as a result of his preaching, they ask, what can we do? And Peter says, you can, be, you can accept the Lord Jesus Christ, respond to the Holy Spirit in your life, and be baptized. And they are converted, 3,000 people. There's also the story, the wonderful story of, of Saul's conversion. We know him as Paul. But before that, he was called Saul. He was a Pharisee. And he had been sent by the Jewish authorities to go to the nearby villages and to arrest the Christians, to bring them back bound in chains to Jerusalem where they would be tried as heretics, possibly stoned to death. And so this Saul was going with permission to do this. And on his way, on the road to Damascus, he sees this light and a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ talking to him. 
And this is after Jesus has uh, ascended into heaven. It's after uh, Pentecost. It's after the time that the Holy Spirit came in to the lives and the church. And Jesus says to Saul, why do you persecute me? And he causes him to go blind. And Saul goes then to a nearby town, to Damascus, and he waits for the healing of Ananias. And it's a process. And he hears the gospel story from Ananias. And he takes some time and he dwells on this. He's healed of his blindness. And he takes a lot of time to consider what, is, what has happened to my life? What, is, what does this vision mean? And he eventually is converted. And then we have this story today. It's a wonderful story, and that's the actual happening is before the scripture reading. Uh, the scripture reading we have is Peter recounting the story again. So the story is told a couple of times in Acts, and that's that helps to show its significance. Anytime you're reading in the in the Bible, in the Old Testament or the New Testament, and they tell a story and then they repeat it again a little bit later when the person is uh, accounting it to someone else, it means pay attention to this story. This is an important story. Peter was up on the roof in, uh, in the town of Joppa, and he was spending some time praying, and he had this vision. He was hungry while he was up there, and he had this vision where uh, this sheet was being lowered to him. And on the sheet, Peter says, there were uh, many animals, and these were four-footed predatory animals. Now, God allows the Jews to eat uh, some four-footed animals, but the ones who are carnivorous, God doesn't usually let, uh, that was against the Jewish uh, eating rituals. As R Rashida had pointed out, there were some foods that were not allowed, as well as other animals, pigs, that would not be allowed uh, to be eaten by Jews, things like that. And there were also reptiles here and certain carrion birds that were on this sheet. And Peter heard God's voice say, kill and eat. And Peter, this is so much like Peter, who argues, tends to argue not only with Jesus, but in this case, even with God, who tells him, kill and eat. He says, no way, God. I have, I have all my life kept uh, unclean food from my lips. Never let them touch my lips. And I'm not about to start now. And God says, what God has made clean you must not call profane. And this happens three times. Kill and eat. No way, God. Three seems to be a big number for Peter, doesn't it? He denies Jesus three times. Jesus says, feed my sheep three times. And now three times he's asked, he's told, kill and eat. And Peter says, no. And God says each time, what God has made clean you must not call profane. So apparently during this same time, a man named Cornelius also had a vision. Now Cornelius is a Gentile. He's also a Roman soldier. And he had a vision. An angel came to him who told him, go to Joppa and ask for Peter, and he will tell you some good news. Invite him to your home and ask him to tell you, and it will bring salvation to your house. And so just as the, the third time as Peter has this in this vision, this message from God, someone comes up to the roof and says, there's a man downstairs, some men downstairs, and they're calling for you. And so he goes down, and there he hears the story of Cornelius about this angel coming to him, sending him to him, but Cornelius is a Gentile. And here's where... Peter starts making these connections. Cornelius is a Gentile, which means he doesn't follow Jewish rituals. It also means that because of Peter's upbringing, he has not been allowed to, uh, to spend time in the home of a Gentile. The Jews, the devout Jews in, in Jesus' day, in Peter's day, were told, do not go into the homes of the Gentiles. Especially don't sit down at the table of a Gentile and eat a meal. And especially don't include them in your religious rituals. So what does Peter do when he hears Cornelius' story? He goes to his house. He sits down at his table, and eventually he baptizes his family. Now this is huge. 
And so where we pick up the story is Peter has now gone to the, the church leaders in Jerusalem. He's come back to Jerusalem, and they have heard that the Gentiles are being baptized by Peter. The Gentiles and Peter are sitting down at a table together. Peter is going into the homes of the Gentiles. And it's hard for us today to understand the severity of this in the minds of the early church. But understand that throughout their lives, they have heard that this group of people is not to be a part of the congregation. They've not been circumcised. They are not Jews. They do not follow our ways. They are not clean. They are profane, is the way that they've been learning. And now, the Holy Spirit is doing something different. What is going on? The Holy Spirit has converted Cornelius, and that's what Peter shares. He tells the story, this is what I found. And I couldn't help, but when I heard the story, I couldn't help but remember the words of our Lord who said, you will go and you will preach and you will baptize some people. John has baptized a, a baptism of forgiveness, but you will baptize a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this is what Peter says. And then he says, God told me that what God has made clean, you should not call profane. And then he said, I figured if it's good enough for God's Holy Spirit, then who am I to stand in God's way and say, no? You have many conversion stories. It, it's a celebration to, to hear how God has stepped into your lives and done something different than our neighbors, our parents, our brothers and sisters, the different ways, and sometimes when we hear one person's conversion story, we might think, this seems really alien to me, that God would, would speak to you through this way or through that way, or in this setting or that setting, or the way your life was at this time, and that God would use that. But the Holy Spirit is something we cannot put a, bri a bit and bridle on. It's not something that we can say, this is the way the Holy Spirit has to work. And when we come to celebrate in worship, we celebrate the distinct um, variety that God reaches out to us, if it can be called that. The many different ways, even in the, gospel of, or the, the book of Acts, we find so many ways that that Spirit moves like the wind, like a flame, and just decide, goes where it wills and understands what each individual needs. What God has made clean, we must not call profane. Through Jesus Christ, God has made us all clean. By his love, by his forgiveness, we need to only accept that forgiveness. And that's part of the gospel story, helping others to recognize that, that because of Jesus Christ, because of the grace that, that God shows us in the love of Christ, you are made clean. Can you accept that and allow it to change your life? I encourage you to go from this place to those stories and those avenues and those locations where people are unsure if they can be accepted into a community of faith. There are people out there who say, you know, I, the way my life is, I'm not sure that either I can go into a place like that or that a place like that would accept me. But the story is that the Holy Spirit is working in every life in bringing people to conversion in God's own time and in the story that they have before them. Thanks be to God. As we come before God with our offering this morning, I want to encourage you to keep in mind our offering plate that's out in the narthex. These are the ways by your gifts these, and offerings, these are the ways that Hopewell is able to reach out uh, in concern and service in the world, in the community. Reach out to the people that are in need, the people who we are trying to, to show that, that God loves them. 
But also, I want to encourage you to look inwardly at your own gifts, at what God has provided for you and how God is strengthening you, and offer those gifts to God this morning during this time of offering. So, as Becky plays the offertory music, would you consciously consider what God is calling you to give at this time? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God, we are grateful for the many ways you have gifted our lives, you have blessed us. We ask that you would take this that we offer you, our gifts, our presence, and use them toward your glory, that all might see the love that you offer to the world. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of service, this, this well, right now, is number 549, Where Charity and Love Prevail. We'll sing the first verse third, fourth, and sixth. What God has made clean, we must not call profane. 
And that means that there is a world out there, a creation out there that God is redeeming and calling us to go and spread the gospel. Do it through your life, through your reactions, through your love. Go in peace. Amen.